plantations in the Deep South during the period before the Civil War were massive and complex operations. They were the megacorporations of the time. They specialized in specific cash crops such as cotton, tobacco, and sugarcane. They also had a tremendous need for labor, and at this time in American history, that meant slave labor. Understandably, there were many attempts by slave laborers to find ways of fleeing these plantations, ending their lives of servitude. Sometimes, though, they were never able to escape their prison. Running through the swamps was dangerous. Alligators, venomous snakes, and disease-carrying insects were just a few of the threats of the swamp in Louisiana. Every step could mean death, but staying would have been even worse. Tom knew that the risk of this journey meant a chance at a free life. Every dangerous step was a few feet closer to a life free of suffering. The journey was long and it was all done on foot. There was no river to float down and no horse to ride. The swamps could be shallow enough to walk in, but many were so deep he had to swim. The animal predators were nothing compared to the humans who were hunting him. As far as they were concerned, he was also an animal. He was their property, and his job was to work the fields and make money for his owner. The value of his labor, along with the generations of offspring he could provide, was so high that there was a huge price on his head, as high as a thousand dollars. Tom wasn't going to just be able to run off. His white owner was looking for him, and he had incentivized others to look for him as well. Ambroise Heidel emigrated from Germany to Louisiana with his mother and siblings in 1721. His father, Johann, had died the previous year, and it's believed that his mother died shortly after arriving in America. Ambroise eventually married Marguerite Schaff and had ten children, seven sons and three daughters. By 1732, he had about 13 acres of land that he farmed, raising occasional livestock. After 30 years in Louisiana, in 1752, Ambrose had enough wealth to purchase another five-acre tract of land. They used this land to begin cultivating indigo on a plantation they called Habitation Hadel. Indigo tinctoria is a species of plant from the bean family that was one of the original sources of blue pigment for dyes. The enslaved women grew and maintained the indigo crops. Enslaved men produced the dye from the plants. First, the indigo plants were put in water to ferment and oxidize in a complicated multi-step process. Once fermented, the leaves dyed the water a deep blue and it would be stirred continuously for several hours to stimulate oxidation. Then they introduced lime to hasten the process of sedimentation where the dye would separate from the water and settle to the bottom of the tank. Once it was fully separated, enslaved workers drained the water, leaving the indigo dye behind in the tank. The sediment was dried and cut into cubes, making it ready to be sold. Slaves began arriving in Louisiana from Africa in the early 1700s. Most of the slaves were brought from an area around what is now known as Senegal. By 1801, 58 African slaves were working at Habitation Haydel. By the time of the Civil War, there were 101 slaves on the property and there had been over 300 over the life of the plantation. The life of a slave on a plantation was a life of constant torture. Slaves got up before the sun as early as 4 a.m. They ate breakfast, which was usually some type of porridge or gruel, and many of them ate out of a communal trough. Plantation slaves worked the fields, tended to livestock, built and repaired machinery, and processed the crops. If a slave woman had a baby who was breastfeeding, she was allowed to go back to the barracks twice a day to feed her baby. If you're a parent, you know that a baby needs to be fed far more often than that. So this caused malnutrition, which increased illness and death within the slave children, 
The slaves were back in their barracks, which were small cabins that each housed two families when the sun went down. The slaves worked from before the sun came up to after the sun went down. They called that working no see to no see. There was usually no furniture in the rooms, so the slaves at Habitation Haydell slept on the wood floor, but many other plantations had barracks with dirt floors. A domestic slave was one that worked inside the main house on the plantation. They were treated like a slave, but their life could be a little better. They usually lived in the main house with the slave owner's family and did a number of jobs from cooking and cleaning to taking care of the slave owner's children. That included acting as a wet nurse to feed the slave owner's infants. Some slaves were assigned to specific family members and would sleep on the floor in their rooms. They would clean the room and start a fire, where they would use a small metal pan full of coals to warm the bed in the winter. Slave workers were controlled by an overseer. This was an employee of the plantation owner whose job it was to ensure the slaves were doing the most work they could. If slaves weren't working fast enough, the overseer would yell at them or take more severe punishment like whipping them or even selling them off to another slave owner, essentially separating them from their family. They also had slave drivers who were other slaves put into a position of power above the other field workers and tasked with ensuring the work was being done as fast as possible. This created resentment between the slave driver and the other slaves, even though the slave driver was being forced into that position himself. Plantations began developing a system of slave codes that did differ from state to state but had many of the same principles. One could not do business with a slave without the prior consent of the owner. Slaves could be awarded as prizes and raffles, wagered in gambling, offered as security for loans, and transferred as gifts from one person to another. A slave was not permitted to keep a gun. If caught carrying a gun, the slave received 39 lashes and forfeited the gun. Blacks were held incompetent as witnesses in legal cases involving whites. The education of slaves was prohibited. Anyone operating a school or teaching reading and writing to any African American in Missouri could be punished by a fine of not less than $500 and up to six months in jail. Slaves could not assemble without a white person present. Marriages between slaves were not considered legally binding. Therefore, owners were free to split up families through sale. Any slave found guilty of arson, rape of a white woman, or conspiracy to rebel was put to death. However, since a slave woman was chattel, a white man who raped her was guilty only of trespass on the master's property. Rape was common on the plantation and very few cases were ever reported. Slaves resisted their treatment in a number of ways. They slowed down their work pace, disabled machinery, feigned sickness, and destroyed crops. They argued and fought with their masters and overseers. Many stole livestock, other food or valuables. Some learned to read and write, a practice forbidden by law. Some burned forests and buildings. Others killed their masters outright, some using weapons, other by putting poison in their food. Some slaves committed suicide or mutilated themselves to ruin their property value. Subtly or overtly, enslaved African Americans found ways to sabotage the systems in which they lived. Then there were the ones who escaped. Tom knew that this was a one-way journey. The truth was, most slaves that attempted to escape from their slave owners were not successful. The terrain was rough and there was little food or shelter. In some states like Kentucky or Virginia, they bordered free states and their journey was short with the help of the Underground Railroad. From Louisiana, though, a fugitive slave had to travel 800 miles and the Underground Railroad had them passing through Mississippi, Tennessee, and Kentucky before arriving at a free state. This journey could take up to six weeks and meant the constant threat of local sheriffs, slave catchers, or civilian lynch mobs. Plantation owners whose slaves ran away frequently placed advertisements in local newspapers, offering a reward that could run as high as $1,000 a not unreasonable price considering the multiple lifetimes of free labor a plantation owner could hope to gain from a slave and his or her children. Tom wasn't willing to chance that journey, so he chose to flee about 60 miles east to an encampment of fugitive slaves living in the swamps near Lake Bourne. If he was caught, the punishment would be severe. 
depending on a variety of factors, such as how long the slave was gone, or if they came back on their own or were captured and forcefully returned. The punishment could range from verbal abuse to death, though most commonly they were whipped and or beaten. At Habitation Haydel, a runaway slave would be branded on one shoulder with an image of a fleur de lis, and the tops of their ears would be cut off as a first offense. The second offense would get the slave a second brand on the other shoulder, and they would have their hamstring muscle cut. This was intended to make a slave unable to run, but if they were able to get away a third time, the punishment was death by decapitation. Tom had no intention of returning on his own, so he had to make sure he reached the camp, or he died trying. At the end of the 18th century, the indigo industry was destroyed by plant diseases and competition in the market. In 1795, sugar replaced indigo as the dominant crop grown on plantations in Louisiana. By this time, it's believed that Ambrose had died, and his son, Jean Jacques Hedel Sr., was now running the plantation. At the time of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, Jean Jacques had made a land claim before the American authorities for 15 acres fronting the Mississippi River. This land claim included his father's original tract as well as expansions made after his death. After the Louisiana Purchase, people began expanding west with plans to start cotton plantations. That would require a lot of labor and the goal was to have it done by slaves. The import of slaves from Africa had slowed, but with the upcoming demand increase, slave traders in South Carolina began bringing in as many slaves as they could. On March 2, 1807, the U.S. Congress ratified an act prohibiting importation of slaves. This preemptive law simply stated that the importation of any persons for the purpose of slavery shall become illegal on the first day of January, 1808 and thereafter it shall be illegal for any U.S. citizen to participate in any way in the transportation of any people for the purposes of slavery. Once it became illegal to import slaves from Africa, slavers began focusing their energy on breeding. This made female slaves go up in price based on their reproductive value, which was referred to as their increase. A woman would be sold, and her increase, along with any offspring she produced, would then belong to the person who purchased her. If she was younger and had the potential to produce more offspring, she would be sold for a higher amount than other women who may not have the same reproductive potential. These women were treated like cattle, used for continual breeding of new slaves, like something you'd see in a futuristic dystopian sci-fi movie, but it really happened, and it was 200 years ago. In 1820, Jean-Jacques Haydel Sr. passed the property to his sons, Marceline and Jean-Jacques Jr. These two men operated the plantation in a partnership for 20 years. Once Marceline died in 1840, his widow, Azalee, took over, and by then the plantation was producing 407,000 pounds of sugar a season. Sugarcane was planted in January and February and harvested mid-October to December. After the planting season, enslaved workers began working in other areas of the plantation, such as cultivating corn and other food crops, harvesting wood from the surrounding forest, and maintaining levees and canals. The harvest season for sugarcane began in October. Sugarcane had to be processed immediately after it was cut or else it would start to die and make an inferior product. Field hands would cut the cane and load it into carts which were driven to the sugar mill. The cane was ground in order to extract the sugar juice inside the stalks. This juice was then boiled down in a series of open kettles called the Jamaica Train. This process had to be done continually 24 hours a day, so the slaves worked in continual shifts. It was hot and dangerous work since the boiling mixture was sticky. If any got on your skin, it would continue to burn. The sugar was boiled down until it crystallized. Sugar plantations produced raw sugar as well as molasses, which were packed into wooden barrels on the plantation and shipped out to markets in New Orleans. In 1850, the United States acted a new Fugitive Slave Act. The first Fugitive Slave Act was enacted in 1793 and authorized local governments to seize and send escaped slaves back to their owners. The new act imposed harsher penalties on people who were helping escaped slaves or impeding their capture. 
This made the prospect of fleeing slavery even less promising since arriving in a free state wouldn't guarantee their safety. Dodging cypress trees as every step splashed down on the water-soaked soil, soon Tom would arrive at an area of raised earth that was above the waterline. There he would meet Jean St. Mallow, who ran a camp of runaway slaves in an area near Lake Bourne. Jean St. Mallow was the leader of a group of runaway slaves who lived in the swamp east of New Orleans. Slaves who escaped their slave owners in Louisiana were known as maroons, and some of them would travel to cities where they would try to blend in and pass as free. Others wanted to live on their own terms, so they set up camps and protected themselves with weapons they received from free people of color. Some would dig caves underground and live out of sight, even giving birth and raising their children there. This was preferable to being a slave and having your children become slaves. Someone alone in the swamp might not be able to survive for long, but the group together were able to start hunting and fishing. They developed gardens where they would grow corn, sweet potatoes, and other vegetables. They raised pigs and chickens and would cut wood to sell as firewood in the city. They could even make deals with other slave owners to provide services in exchange for food and money, letting the slave owner get some extra labor without having to pay the initial expense of purchasing a new slave. Of course, the rest of their needs would be met by stealing the supplies they needed. A pair of maroons in this camp were able to steal a barrel of sugar, one of salt, one of lard, 100 bottles of wine, two soup dishes, a churn for butter, two oxen, and six pregnant cows. Fugitive slaves didn't consider stealing from white people, well, stealing. They believed that they were entitled to whatever they were taking because they were the ones who actually produced it. The abolitionist movement started long before the Civil War, but it really picked up steam in the decades before 1860. People in the North had already had a plan to gradually free the slaves, but popular opinion shifted and they wanted all the slaves to be freed immediately. This is likely due to stories from escaped slaves who fled to the North, bringing with them the truth of what horrors they had previously lived with. After Abraham Lincoln was elected president on an anti-slavery platform, seven southern states seceded from the Union starting with South Carolina on December 20, 1860, with the remaining six states following in January and February of 1861. The southern states argued for states' rights, basically the right to own slaves. After the Louisiana Purchase, southern states wanted to expand further west off the backs of slaves and if slavery was outlawed, they would have to pay for that labor. The next few months was a contentious time in the United States. As Lee Haydell died just before the start of the Civil War, and during this period, the plantation could not be sold. Over the course of the war, the plantation lost enslaved workers who ran to join the Union Army. Seems like a no-brainer for slaves to fight for the side that wanted to free them, but the Confederate Army relied heavily on slave soldiers as well. Some people cite this as evidence that the slaves supported the Confederacy, but they really didn't have a choice. They were slaves. The Battle of Fort Sumter kicked off the Civil War on April 12, 1861, and for the next four years, the two halves of the country battled it out for control. Hundreds of thousands of lives were lost, and the freedom of an entire race of people was in the balance. When General Lee surrendered at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia on April 9, 1865, it started a string of surrenders that ended the Civil War in the United States. Abraham Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863. He wrote, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states, and parts of states, are and henceforth shall be free. This executive order was directed to the ten states that were still in rebellion and the three and a half million slaves in the South were freed as Union soldiers arrived in each area in question. The last slaves were freed on June 19, 1865, which is celebrated today as the holiday Juneteenth. The addition of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment made slavery illegal, made anyone born in the U.S. a citizen, and gave everyone the right to vote, no matter their race or color, which of course would change later. Once the slaves were freed, they were able to gradually leave the swamps and make lives for themselves and their families out in the world. 
In the southern states, these were usually lives of poverty where they still lived under the control of white men. Some free slaves took possession of plantations that had been abandoned by their slave owners and began growing their own crops. Despite being free, they had restrictions on everything they did. They had the right to vote, but if they did, they would suffer punishment. Some would be arrested on trivial charges and left in jail for extended periods of time in order to keep them from working their farms. Now technically free, African Americans would begin the never-ending struggle for civil rights amongst the other citizens of this country. In 1867, the plantation was finally sold to Bradish Johnson, a major businessman and plantation owner with roots in Louisiana and New York. He purchased two plantations on the west bank of the Mississippi River after the war and named them Carroll and Whitney, in honor of his daughters who married men with those last names. When Whitney Plantation began its operations in January of 1868, it did so with a workforce comprised of paid employees. 30% of those employees had previously been slaves on the plantation. The conditions weren't much better, though, as labor rights wouldn't begin changing in favor of workers until the 1920s. Ownership of the plantation changed hands many times before the Formosa Chemicals and Fiber Company purchased the land in 1990 with the intention of moving production there. Due to backlash in the community, they abandoned those plans and the plantation was purchased in 1999 and turned into a museum. When you're working the land for your own crops, think about the blood, sweat, and tears that are in the soil. The people who were there before you, having been forced to give their life for a plantation's bottom line. Work your farm and prosper. Just don't sow anything that you don't want to come back later and reap. Thanks for letting us tell you this sinister story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on and hit like, rate it, or leave a comment. Join us next week where we'll take you somewhere sinister.